Okay, Dr. Kevin Reese, welcome back. And Peter R. Hengelski, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I assume most people listening would have no idea who you are, but you were involved in some very, very important cases in our business with Dr. Joel Wallach. He talks about all the time these nine lawsuits that he's had with the FDA. And mm -hmm. you were directly involved in the litigation of four of them, but you're also familiar with, with the rest of these cases and many other connected cases, as you have said, that come from these, basically. So I would love it if you could just introduce yourself and we could jump right into the beginning of all these cases. How did this all start? I mean, it's a weird situation having to sue the FDA for information or for the ability to use certain information. You know, people think of lawsuits in alternative health or health. They might think that the FDA is suing us, but no, it's the other way around. <laughs> so if you yeah, can walk right. us right from the beginning, that would be amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, of course. And so by way of background, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a partner in the, in the law firm Emord and Associates. Our name partner, Jonathan Emord, has been um, practicing in this space for over, you know, I think it was 35 years now. And we, especially early on, soon after the, the passage of the Diche, our firm was instrumental in pushing some of these you know, major landmark decisions forward under the First Amendment. And we could not have obviously done that without the help of wonderful um, clients like the Wallachs like Ingevity, like Dr. Whitaker, Dirk and Sandy Shaw, these were um, these people were just instrumental in being able to, to, to put us where we needed to go. And so the, the cases that we you mentioned, they began in 1999 with what was the landmark decision in Pearson v. Shalala. But it, I think to, to sort of explain where those, how those cases actually came to be, I just need to rewind time a little bit more most people who, who deal with you know this this area of law they know very well the DSHA, the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act that was passed in 1994 and before the DSHA, uh dietary supplements were not its own category uh, of a regular they they weren't regulated as as, as uh, anything other than food additives mm -hmm. the DSHA changed that so what would happen in, in years past before DSHA, if you had a dietary supplement of food, anything really, um, it, was reg it was regulated as a food additive. And that, that regulatory framework gave the FDA incredible control over what could be said about foods and dietary supplements. When DSHA passed in 94, it gave manufacturers the ability to, to you know, increase the amount of what we call claims, but really it's just health information that's disseminated about things we commonly ingest and, and you know dietary supplements became its own regulatory class and that opened the doors for um, broader dissemination of information but the FDA very strongly resisted that they're an agency that in at least in in the field of foods and dietary supplements um, they operate primarily as a sensor sensor of, of speech sensor of information that you can you can convey to, cons to consumers to patients and they um, very actively resisted the passage of the DSA. They, they actively resisted any, anything that came after that fact. Jonathan E. Moore, he sued the FDA in, um, in, in the district court, I believe it was 98 or, or 97. And then it, it found its way to the circuit court for the, for the um, D.C. circuit in 1999. And um, that led to a landmark First Amendment ruling in the field of dietary supplement uh, regulation, where the, the D.C. Circuit ruled against the FDA on censorship of certain health claims. And you know, looking back on this, it seems crazy for us to think about it, but at issue in those cases were, were health claims that we just take for granted these days. You know, the, the case was about whether uh, businesses... You know, businesses like Ingevity, businesses like, um, you know, any anyone out there who's selling dietary supplements, could they tell consumers that consumption of folic acid would reduce the risk of neural tube defects if taken you know, during pregnancy? And that claim is, 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 you know, almost taken for scientific granted at this point, isn't it? I mean, every, everybody every, knows it. Everybody knows it. Everyone that. does it. Yeah. You know, women are taking neonatals, um, prenatals rather, with... Um, with folic acid for a reason, and, and this is why. But the FDA would, 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 would not allow those claims to go forward because they impose a standard 
of proof on these claims that was insurmountable. And it was called the significant scientific agreement standard, meaning you could not say to consumers truthful information about what your product would do or what your dietary ingredient do unless pretty much every scientist in the country would agree with you. But there's no such thing. Science is, is not conclusive. And you know, there will always be disagreement. And there's a lot of truth in science that you, know, you, can, you can still convey to consumers and it may not rise to the level of, of scientific consensus. And so we sued, or Jonathan sued, in Pearson. And um, at issue also were, were other claims, um, I think a- antioxidant vitamins and the reduction of certain cancers, right? I mean, mm. um, omega-3 fatty acids and reduction of risk in um, certain types of cardiovascular concerns and heart disease, um, fiber and its relationship in preventing or reducing the risk of colorectal cancers. Uh, again, these are claims now that have been in the market for so long, we don't even question them anymore, but it's important for everyone to realize at the time, the FDA was actively trying to keep this information from consumers. Mm. And the DC circuit in Pearson, it dramatically shook up the FDA's ability to keep and set it, this type of health information from consumers. And they created what was now known as the qualified health claims regime. So under that case, you could now, if, if you had support for your claims, you could provide truthful speech to consumers as long as you inform those consumers that the science was, was inconclusive. So you had to put disclaimers on your, on your statements, but you were at least allowed to tell consumers that this information exists supporting the, you know, the um, risk reductive effects of these dietary ingredients. And so we went from a state of of almost complete censorship and overnight we now have this this regime where where manufacturers were able to at least try to pursue these qualified health claims and so after pearson we had a period where the fda fought aggressively against that decision and rather than you know implement the decision and follow through with it they put roadblocks up at, at times, they followed for reconsideration with the court. They refused to abide by the D.C. Circuit's command to consider certain qualified health claims. And that started then a string of additional cases that, you know, I, I'm sure Dr. Wallach has mentioned as part of those nine cases he was involved in. So some of those were at the district court level. The Whitaker 1 decision was a case that that was we we basically sued the fda because they were again refusing to allow the antioxidant claim and um the district court in that case had some incredibly harsh words for the fda and again set a strong precedent moving forward and then you know we, so i mean it, it you know we, not without getting into the details of each specific case i can say that those cases sort of went along the train basically in trying to enforce the Pearson decision from 99. And then years later, we were involved again with um, the help of longevity and, and Dr. Wallach with cases that we filed on behalf of the Alliance for Natural Health, um, the USA division. And those there were two parallel cases that we filed on the same type of grounds where we were looking to enforce health claims or fi- we were fighting against FDA censorship of health claims in one one case related to selenium and its association with the reduction of certain um, types of cancers. And the other case was vitamins C and E and its relationship with, with risk reductive effects of certain types of cancers. And those cases were also won. Now, you know, when, FDA- when you're presenting this type of evidence here, because you're, you're kind of racing through this here, I just kind of want to yeah. zoom in just, just a little bit. I, I love law and order, for example. You know, I love seeing Jack McCoy up there really, you know, tearing a witness, a new one on on cross-examination. Did you know it was wrong when you woke up that morning? Yes. Did you know it was wrong when you ate your cereal? Yes. He's badgering, Your Honor. Sit down and shut up, Mr. Feynman. Overruled. But I'm just wondering how the court proceeding actually is around all these nutrients, because You're talking Mm -hmm. about the standard of proof, and now it's, of course, called qualified health claims, but it's like a mountain of evidence, right? So do you have to literally read all of this out in court? I'm imagining this is a super long process, and these are very detailed studies for a lot of these things. Right, yeah. Um, Well, so it starts with a petition to the agency where we we try to supply as much as we can uh, from the science. 
And in every one of these cases, we had the support of incredibly qualified experts. And so you look at the ANH case, for example, on selenium, we had Dr. Gerhard Schrauser and one of the world's foremost experts on, on the relationship of selenium with these types of diseases. Your question is, it's, it's triggering because it, it, it's, it, it's interesting how the FDA actually processes this information and then how we end up in court based on it. So in these instances, these, these two more recent cases, we would, I think in both, we provided over 120 studies, peer-reviewed studies that supported the relationship between these, these ingredients and disease. And what the FDA does with that information is they basically go through and they systematically weed out the science. They've decided that rather than deal with the Pearson decision on its face, they created a construct by which they can actually, you know, based on you know, often you know, pretextual or, or frankly, silly reasons, unscientific bases, they can just ignore your science. And so in in these cases when we when we would submit 115 clinical studies for 134 i think in one of the case they would review them and they'd say well despite you having all the scientific evidence we only looked at maybe one or two studies and found those to be credible and then then that allows them to act as though you have no scientific support <laughs> for your claim because they're ignoring 98 percent of the, stu the studies that you submitted then what happens is we, we sue the agency based on that decision. And then that goes to, um, it, it proceeds on an administrative law track through the federal courts. And then that means it's a frozen administrative record. So it's not like the law and order. It's not, I don't have the opportunity. I wish I did, but I don't have the opportunity to put it, somebody from the FDA on a stand. These are um, basically resolved on cross motions for summary judgment. And our, where we're, we're trying to convince the federal district court and then eventually the circuit court that the FDA botched it when, when we had the materials in front of the agency. Um, so it is possible then to gain a qualified health claim just by submitting the 130 whatever studies. And they could just say, okay, you know, actually 65 of these seem super legit. Let's just check this box. Boom, it's in. That, you have to sue them every time. No, and it is, I mean, obviously, depending on the level of your scientific support, um, you know, the, the FDA is going to prioritize human clinical studies, double blinded. And so if you have, uh, it, it's certainly within the realm of possibility that you might have a incredibly strong scientific record, and then you may not ever have to sue. The unfortunate part is that that evidence, especially in the dietary supplement world, almost never exists. So, I mean, there's, and there's reasons for that. And I think that's obvious. I mean, the the randomized clinical study model that's very effective for pharmaceuticals and drugs because oftentimes you're testing um, against an acute condition and you can tell whether or not a product has certain efficacy within you know this uh, a period of months but if you're trying to prove that a dietary ingredient reduces your risk of of contracting cancers over a lifetime um you know, how do you design a study that can be conducted to measure that with you know and also have reliability so yeah some folks have tried there have been some famous studies along the way but uh, overall the level of data that fda is trying to impose on the dietary supplement and food world is really impractical so, and so meanwhile cheerios are allowed to say heart healthy on the box <laughs> Right, right, because there's certainly right because they there there are you know obviously um, there's certain types of claims that can be made by regulation that that folks have carved out based on you know nutritional profiles, so they can say things like that, of course, right? And they uh, use they use the word may in front of it, right? May lower cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and then you have those types of claims, right? Those are the health claims. So just before uh, I let you jump back into the story, I just kind of want to point this out. This is like truth by trial here, right? Like it's like they're deciding that for nutritional information specifically and drug information, but this is in the public domain, nutritional information, they're limiting us, anybody selling, anybody practicing, you know, with people or whatever, they're limiting what we can say based on the truth that has been determined by a tribunal. Whereas this really just 
isn't imposed on so many different industries you know i'm thinking about cars and stuff you mm -hmm. know it's a life or death situation in cars but you know what they can tell you on a car commercial is it seems to be limitless <laughs> without legal ramifications you right. know but here uh, it's it's just it, it's so restricted you're right because like you said the standard of proof thing is a really weird concept i've heard the argument like oh we shouldn't be able to say that uh you know taking selenium will lower your risk of this cancer by this percent we shouldn't be able to just say that because people can't necessarily understand the intricacies of how we get to those statistics you know right. it is based on each studies and and the regular person doesn't doesn't read the deep study and all this stuff so it's improper to just give them that statistic meanwhile the news and media and all they use statistics all the time and they misuse them all the time too and we do i believe that in the free market people should be able to look at statistics the way they're presented by media by someone like me a salesperson a physician and you can choose also to look deeper into that and you can choose to understand statistics and maybe we should all understand statistics a little bit better but my point here is that the truth is tangled up in these statistics <laughs> and it can be complicated but there's a heck of a lot of it out there and if the fda rejects you know uh, over 100 out of 130 right off the bat then you know, we're extremely limited here on what we can discuss, what we can talk about, what we can say on products, about products, what we can even imply that products are being used for and all this stuff. It's it, There's no other industry like it, to my knowledge, that is actually this restricted. Acupuncturists can say all kinds of things, mm -hmm. you know, and it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. And if you want to fully believe the tarot card reader, that's up to you, you know, but the FDA is not on them. Anyways, I just kind of wanted to jump in there and say how, <laughs> how, how kind of crazy yeah. this is. Well, I mean, it, you get into the space and you, and you learn. I, I think the average American doesn't have an, uh, any clear understanding of just how um, really unconstitutional the administrative system is. Um, and you see that it, with the FDA because it is an agency that's you know, its primary function is that of censorship. And, and when you look at just how lost First Amendment protections have gotten within the, that framework, it's shocking. And I think, you know, we, we have we have new attorneys that come on our firm and they have various beliefs of this and that, and they, and they spend a little time just uh, trying to understand how the administrative law works and how the FDA works and how, frankly, unaccountable they are to the judicial branch. And it's, it, it, you know, it, it is an eye-opening and shocking experience for most people. The more you learn, the more shocked you get. And, and that, by the way, what you, what you were just referencing was an argument the FDA actually made in the Pearson cases, which the D.C. Circuit rejected. It was this concept that the FDA knows better than you. They know better than you as to what you should be, you know, as a consumer, what you, what, what information you should have a right to receive. They need to act as, you know, in this paternalistic sense, to protect you from information that you might not be able to fully understand or appreciate. And the D.C. Circuit was was very harsh against that position and and excoriated the FDA and said we are highly dubious of any distinction like that 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 is built upon the supposed ignorance of consumers. You know, we obviously have argued time and again that consumers should have the right to receive information. First Amendment is a, is a two-way street. It's not just people think of it like it's, it's the freedom of speech, but it's also the freedom to receive speech. Um, and when you stifle that, when you stifle some, but when you act as a censor, you're, you're affecting both sides. That's where I think massive injury happens. And, and so, you know, the FDA, we can talk, of course, about FDA's mechanism to regulate, and they attach it to commerce, which is why in some instances, physicians and practitioners have a little more leeway in what they're able to say. But it's still, I mean, I think it's still one of the biggest impediments um, that the dietary supplement and food world faces when they're looking, you know, from a marketing perspective, they have to still operate within this, this regime that the FDA, you know, obviously you know, strictly enforces now you you mentioned freedom of speech and the other day when we spoke we talked about social media mm -hmm. and you had mentioned to me that when you're not promoting a product specifically on social media in other words you're not holding it up and being like blah 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 then you become just an inf it's freedom of speech if you're mm -hmm. not doing a product directly but if you do a product directly you're now in the gray area of a salesman is that correct 
Well, right. Maybe not even gray area. Um, you know, it might be directly regulable. Um, but the idea is, I mean, as, as somebody who's, who's presenting medical and scientific information, you have a first amendment right to speak on those topics. And it's not until there's a commercial component to your speech where, where you start to get into, um, spheres where the agencies can regulate in this, in this context, right? I mean, obviously, you know, not all speech is protected, but, um, so if you're if you have a commercial component to your speech, if you're directing people to um, a website to purchase, let's say if um, you know if you're holding you know products up as you're speaking or providing links to to product purchase pages, I mean that's an example where the speech that you make would be construed by the FDA as as being commercial, and you know there's a there, because of that commercial component, they would have the ability to regulate perhaps. Um, but where you're not doing that, where you're acting purely in the informational world and you're, you're speaking on, you know, at, as, as a podcast host or you know, as, as an authority, as an expert, perhaps on a, as a guest on a, on some kind of a talk show, or otherwise, if you're just speaking, um, your mind, that's unquestionably protected speech and any effort by the agency to regulate that would be problematic. Mm. And it doesn't happen very often to my knowledge either. It's kind of this hollow threat that's always there. Everybody's scared of saying the wrong thing on stage or on social media. But to my knowledge, I don't know anybody who's been actually prosecuted for charged for other than like Kevin Trudeau for his claims about uh, weight loss and his weight loss book. Right. He's, he's a big name, but I just, he's one of the only names. I don't know if you know any, Peter, any, any other people who have been prosecuted for making health claims or false health claims. Prosecuted, really no, because I mean there there are certain instances where the FDA obviously the FDA has um, there are criminal um, components to the FDCA, the the, the act, um, but r- rare are criminal uh, prosecutions, particularly not on you know this type of issue. We have obvi- obviously there are folks that have sold unapproved drugs are uh, in certain instances. There's sales of unapproved drugs for significant conditions like cancers that that there have been prosecutions based on that most of everything else the fda is going to do in the dietary supplement world is generally in the civil sphere and a lot of what they'll do involves um initially it's it starts with agency enforcement activity you know or if you really offend them or if you refuse to comply at that level then they can sue for injunctive relief in in, in federal court um that can lead to things like you know quarantines of product or you know injunctions prohibiting you from speaking and prohibiting you from selling product um but those are definitely rare examples because usually folks will you know, curtail their activities in response to the fda when they come knocking well th- this day and age they can just turn the switch off meaning they just call the bosses of facebook the bosses of instagram the bosses of tiktok and they just cancel <laughs> very common and i i mean and and they'll shut off you know your your main avenues for revenue i mean amazon.com will will um pull product pages left and right um to the extent that you're doing anything that can be perceived as in violation of federal law and so you know we we deal with that often we're trying to restore access to those types of retail channels and it all flows from the fda's censorship regime and so, you know, as long as that's in place and as long as the FDA has the ability to take these positions and everyone else follows suit. All right. Yeah, but what about defamation? Can the AMA or FDA come after, you know, someone speaking out on social media for defamation? I mean, they're not a person, though. Right. 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 I mean, can an aggrieved person pursue a claim for defamation? Of, uh, well, that right. I mean, obviously, you know, I always say, I mean, we live in a litigious country. People can seemingly sue each other for almost anything these days. But, you know, the, the question always is, will they succeed? In that space that you're, you're uh, you know, mentioning, there are incredibly high burdens to any type of defamation claim. And those are imposed by the First Amendment doctrine. And so you might have heard of constitutional malice, the New York Times standards. There's, there's, protections in place that prevent somebody when you're speak from from facing liability when you are talking about an issue of public importance or you're talking about a person who's in the public sphere but technically if you're on you know social media or otherwise and you are talking about a private person 
and you're um, and it's not on a, a significant issue of public importance, then they they could potentially sue for defamation. You know that that is an option available to people who've been aggrieved. Yeah. Well, one of the things that comes to mind to me is just as an example, let's just say statin drugs, right? Mm-hmm. Now we're typically of the belief that statin drugs are no bueno, right? Mm-hmm. So you go on social media and you say this. And there's a lot of doctors and health professionals saying it now. They're speaking out mm-hmm. that statins were a bad idea, blah, blah, blah. So at what point do the alphabet boys, <laughs> at what point do they say you're an influencer mm. and you're influencing random people to stop taking their drugs? Mm. And that's bad. Yeah, I mean, again, so scientific speech uh, also has its its own special protections under the First Amendment, and so any effort to try to curtail that activity would, is deeply problematic. And um, and they and anyone and we've seen that. I mean, it's you know, yes, the government tried in during times of COVID to stifle a lot of you know, a lot of um, you know speech, similar speech, but um, a lot of the, the 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 real limitations didn't even come from the government; they came from um, you know, private parties like, you know, like those who own social media. And so that's a different equation because that's not governmental conduct. And so, you know, constitutional limits aren't, you know, well, it's at least less clear that any, any protections apply there. But when the government would be involved in speech that you're making, for example, again, they need a, they need some kind of a regulatory hook. And so they need, they need to act under their commerce clause authority if, if that's, you know, available to them. So, if you're saying those types of things and they deem that to be inappropriate and it's related to the sales of certain types of goods, then that's one thing. But if you're just talking um, as a medical professional or somebody who is you know, um, conveying health you know, information, then at that point, without a commercial book, the agency could be powerless and they should be powerless, right? And so there's that's the distinction, commercial connection. Mm. I have uh, some questions about the Whitaker cases, if you'd like to uh, yeah. go there. First of all, who is Whitaker and why was he or she suing? And one of those cases was about uh, Saul Palmetto, wasn't it? Saul Palmetto and, and its influence on the prostate? Yeah, I do. I do think I can't tell you, you know, there was a, there was a series of Whitaker decisions. I don't recall which specific one. Um, but so doc, Dr. Whitaker is um, um, a alternative care pr- provider and he was in, in California and he had a, a very successful practice. And uh, he therefore, because he also, not unlike Dr. Wallach, he had a lot of patients who he treated and his desire was to try to, you know, obviously spread the dissemination of information related to, to helpful products that could help his patients and otherwise. And so he was the name plaintiff on those cases. There were actually, I think, uh, a series of them. A lot of the, those who participated in the Pearson decisions, but be, you know, the case is named because he was the first name plaintiff. And, you know, so Dr. Whitaker was one of the sponsors of that lawsuit. And it started with Whitaker One, which was focused on the antioxidant claim, which was related to, to risk reduction of cancers. And it, from there, there was a series of those that um, that followed. In each instance, the, the cases that followed were a direct result of the FDA simply not doing what the court had instructed it to do in the Pearson cases, which was to try to you know apply reasonable disclaimers to the claims that could be um, appear on product labels and websites and whatever else in commerce. And so what the they, FDA, won, they won the case and then the FDA just didn't follow up and didn't like give wording to the claim? Well, in, right. In, 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 simply put, yes. I mean, what they would do oftentimes, they would, they would play games. And so what they would do is they would try. So what Pearson com- commanded the agency to do was to consider reasonable disclaimers. So I said, you can't ban the speech outright, but you need to fashion reasonable disclaimers that will tell consumers that this the, the, the claim is, is potentially truthful, but that the scientific evidence is not conclusive. And the, the circuit court said, it's not our responsibility, though, to draft those disclaimers. That needs to come from the agency. So what they then did was they, they played with the language of the disclaimers. And then when, when you see what they were proposing, they were the most 
cumbersome, you know, disclaimers that they could have possibly drafted and they are all but swallowing the benefit of the claim. So we had uh, litigation over the nature of those disclaimers and whether or not the agency was actually still trying to ban the claims through um, those cumbersome uh, disclosure requirements. And we continue to win. Now, if you flip this concept around, like we all know watching like a drug commercial on TV, especially in America, it's got like five seconds of, hey, this this drug, whew, I'm doing good on this drug. And then there's like 35, 45 seconds of all the side effects. Now, that yeah. seems reasonable to me in the sense that those products actually do produce harm. Those right. are actual potential side effects of using this product might be a good idea even to display safety records of different products, mechanical products. But in the case of nutrition or in the case of something like saw palmetto, which is not a nutrient, it's a medicine. Either way, we're not looking at lists of side effects here. You know, their right. disclaimer is about like, hey, this maybe maybe sort of isn't true. We don't know. The science is complicated. You know, they, that's what you're kind of telling me. It's like a paragraph of like, I don't know. And this might be good for you, but I don't know. But it's that's not a harm. That's not a side effect. No. That's not a warning, you know warning this vitamin may not fix all of your problems like so what it's as a product that's fundamentally good for you and and you know you're saying and we know that within these cases there are mountains of evidence you know of benefit the argument isn't that there is a benefit or absolutely no benefit the the argument is over the quantification of the benefit you know how much percent risk reduction and all this stuff i know it's tricky to frame a claim like this really a uh, 38% reduction in this cancer only makes sense in the context of that one study it's it really yeah logically can't be used as a broad claim but very mm -hmm. few of us speak that way anyways we use a whole bunch of these like dr wallach in his presentation he'll use like 40 different studies throw them all in there hey this study right. showed a 40 percent reduction on this by using this nutrient then they added in vitamin e and then they got a 70 percent reduction on this you know you you add this up to make your own conclusion that this is it seems to be freaking beneficial <laughs> right and we make oh, the, of course we bring the idea in that, hey, when they use more than one nutrient, more than three nutrients, you get even better results. But my point in just jumping in here was that these the censorship by consensus here is fairly ridiculous, considering there's really not harm. You know, you, you would know right. how much harm there is from drugs. There's all kinds of adverse events reports, which is another right. official thing that needs to be filed. Many, many, many thousands of people die from drugs every single year. This just simply doesn't happen with supplements, even in mega doses. You know, whatever the FDA yeah. says, you can take tens of thousands of percent of their recommendation right. in most cases and just be completely fine. Not a detectable thing happened at all, except you might feel better, have some more energy or something, maybe get diarrhea, who knows, but nothing, nothing actually risky. Uh, there, yeah, uh, there's, there's a tremendous gap in the data um, showing, you know, the prescription drugs and otherwise being your most harmful agents. And obviously dietary supplements have a, a tremendous history of, of safety. And that's that is one of the the leading you know points that you make. I mean, look, diet, you take a dietary supplement. There's nothing works for everybody. Uh, we're all different, right? I mean, and 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 so you know, there's no guarantees. And 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 by the way, drugs don't either. I mean, a lot of times if you look at the data for uh, for these drug studies, I mean, they'll prove drugs that have efficacy efficacy rates that are sometimes you know well under fifty percent. And it all depends on what you know the risk profile and analysis of the FDA reaches, but. The point is, if if I if, if there was a, even a thirty or thirty five percent chance that taking a dietary ingredient over the course of the next ten years would, let's say, you know, dramatically reduce my risk of of, of contracting colorectal cancer or something like that, I'm I, I should have the right to at least try that, and I won't even be able to if I don't have access to the information to be make an informed decision. And realistically, the only risk, the, the only the only harm that I'm facing if it, if I take a product and it doesn't have that effect for me is that I'm out the money that I spent on the product because, in all likelihood, these dietary supplements are not going to be toxic, um, right? I mean, the adverse events you see for a lot of dietary supplements are, you know, we we, we monitor these, we look at them. They're very often um, attributed to misuse, um, or, you know, there's certain types of supplements that have higher safety profiles, as you might expect. I mean, there's, you know, energy drinks, for example, but most dietary supplements are incredibly safe and unless dramatically misused, meaning used beyond what, you know, the directions of use say, or otherwise they're not going, you're not having any, any real risk to consumer safety. And so that's what makes it a real gut punch. When you, when you think about, 
the extreme level of censorship that consumers face. They don't even understand what they're not what they're not receiving because there's so much information out there that only the most informed consumer is able to to really you know to track down, and that's why it's just it's a difficult market from that perspective. Yeah, it's a behind the scenes scheme, some sort of meeting going on behind the scenes with suits, you know. Yeah, people need to take, you know, they have consumers have to have some serious initiative in this day and age to be able to to, to uncover information. Oh yeah, um, which isn't accessible to them, and yeah. it, you know, it's. I'm frankly, a, I'm a yeah I'm a great example because so I have a PhD, and because I market myself as Dr. Reese, I get nailed on social media by people who are very traditional. Mm-hmm. And so they throw the whole you're not a medical doctor thing. Mm-hmm. Right? And and so my response to that is it it I it doesn't matter. If I just called myself Kevin Reese, it, it would be the same information, just like Ryan. Ryan is Ryan Alexander. Like he doesn't need a doctor in front of his name to to spell proper information. And so because it's a PhD, it somehow psychologically rubs some people traditional people the wrong way and they're all like you know you're, you're practicing without a medical license and you're this and i'm just talking about nutrients you know right yeah it's very uh, weird right i mean that that's you know that's that's how uh you know the fda is not the only agency that regulates in that speech i mean the federal trade commission does the same thing and they have guidances that that address um, you know, all kinds of, of social media speech and otherwise. And, and, and these are the things that people talk about. They talk about, you know, protecting consumers from misinformation from somebody who might, you know, try to speak with an air of authority that's unearned or otherwise. And, and I mean, in, in you start in a true free market, the idea is that dissemination of ideas is what the, it should be the goal. Um, that that more information, not less, is always beneficial. And so, whatever you're saying, whatever there, if somebody disagrees with that, if they have a disagreement about it, then they will have a scientific basis to explain why you're wrong. And then consumers benefit from that discourse, uh, from that public debate. Um, the well, people are allowed to disagree, correct? This is like this is within right. the law. We are allowed to disagree on these matters that require interpretation of information. It, it is yeah. difficult to parse all this apart. You do have to interpret it, and we are allowed to disagree. I thought this was how the market worked, right? But it, it's not how with the FDA. Work. It's how it should work. But then you have agencies like the FDA, like like the Federal Trade Commission, whose their their whole existence is built around preventing that level of debate from happening on some levels, right? And so you know that that has a stifling effect throughout. And it and it puts us in a position even where we're you know on this call where you know, where, where where Kevin is is wondering where the line is between him just just speaking on a on a podcast with no com- commercial interest um, that should never be prohibited under the law right there should never be any concerns and the fact that we have people that are worried about um, justifiably worried that there could be some government enforcement is a chill on the First Amendment rights that is just an unfortunate byproduct. But that's what we just constantly fight the agency over. And you know, John, I know Jonathan E. Moore, myself included, are um, steadfast in our in in our in our uh, mission to try to make sure that we can open up markets and and have these types of freedoms of speech actually enforced. Well, you said earlier that many times people will just censor themselves. Uh, not those exact words, but. I was going to say, I definitely censor myself all the time. You know, I even refuse to answer questions about vaccines, for example. And uh, mm-hmm. it's not because of government, like you said, it, it isn't. It's actually a problem with social media. I think, yeah. uh, you know, the government has definitely uh, uh, basically yeah. endorsed the practice of, of medical censorship, especially to, basically by not doing anything about it. Seemed to encourage it, especially during the pandemic. That's when I first started noticing links to government sites about their information about covid and about vaccines right it was during the pandemic i never saw social media slap a government link about any health information on on any of my posts before i've had them taken down my instagram mm-hmm. never had that slap on it so yeah definitely we we censor ourselves in response to that some people didn't and they're okay just getting their account taken down and put back up again but 
this, I, this I is got, my livelihood that we're playing with, right? I can't just disappear from social media, so I have to censor myself. I, it, I got I got slapped for a tampon. No, oh, he's been in big trouble for this tampon thing. Big trouble for this tampon thing. All, all I said is tampons may potentially, that's the key word, potentially cause endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And I've been ferociously attacked for the last week and a half. And Instagram put a big flag on my video as if I was talking about vaccine. Oh, okay. And, yeah, I mean, and the USA Today reached out to me for a quote. I see. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the official position that FDA would take is that they don't regulate the practice of medicine. And, um, you know, they, they, they love to say that. But, but what the government does, they set a medical orthodoxy. And that's routinely enforced throughout, not just by the, the positions the FDA takes in support of drugs and, and approved devices, but also based on, you know, CMS, uh, Medicare regulations and carriage determinations and everything else. All of that combines to basically form, like I mentioned, this, this, you know, this, this medical orthodoxy in the country that is based on, um, you know, whatever the government, you know, sort of says from the top. And, and so anything you tend to say that's against the grain of that, it's susceptible to, to criticism, of course. And I can't even tell you how many of our clients have come under fire for um, doing nothing other than expressing opinion um, on scientific and medical issues. And it just, it's such an in, in, intrinsic threat to the rights we have in this country where that becomes the norm and and it's it's shocking to see but i mean there are you have rights if it's if obviously if it's a if it's government um it's sponsored that if it's an enforcement related to that then obviously you have constitutional protections and there's sometimes private claims involved as well against private actors that are trying to censor depending on depending on the nature of, of what they're doing but I mean, it's it's a it's a rough place we live in at this point, and um, you know, obviously, you know, our hope is that things change. Mm. Are there any other agencies involved here with these lawsuits? Is it always just the FDA? There's no CDC involved or anything like that. No other branches of government. No, not not CDC. I mentioned the Federal Trade Commission, um, and they're they're actually very active in enforcement in in the health and wellness um, areas, and and the FTC. They um, have broader authority to regulate uh, speech than probably the FDA even does because they regulate almost all forms of advertising. So um, you might have, have you know some kind of component that is not necessarily regulated by the FDA, but it, it could be regulated by the FTC. The Kevin Trudeau example is an example, right? And, um, you know, Kevin Trudeau was publishing literature, books. Um, you know, systems, health systems, um, that's not necessarily FDA regulated in that context, but the FTC can regulate that based on what he's saying about that material. But the big concern we also see, and this is something that everyone in the space needs to be aware of, is the state level litigation. And so you have consumers and we'll, we'll basically you have a cottage industry of, of zealous, you know, uh, plaintiffs, attorneys throughout the country, especially in hotbed uh, uh, you know, jurisdictions like California, who are when the FDA, let's say the FDA sends a warning letter or the FTC um, you know, initiates some kind of um, cease and desist proceeding, those consumer plaintiffs are just going to sue in state court because they'll claim violations of unfair competition laws and basically on the same theories so right. yeah i mean so you have you have concerns all over the place it, it's on the state level where we could get hit with the practicing without a medical license right you, yeah and a lot of that's right we've had clients that have um, licensed and unlicensed folks that have faced um, proceedings before state level medical boards because of things they have said. I and mean, we had, you know, we had clients that, uh, you know, had high profile, you know, interviews on, on major networks and faced um, immediate backlash from local medical boards. And, you know, obviously we were incredibly successful in being able to navigate those waters for those individuals because, you know, we, we have powerful First Amendment arguments in response to that. But it doesn't stop the fact that you're exposed to that and there's costs that are, that are attended to those those proceedings. And so all that has a chilling effect because um, you know, there, there's a, there's a percentage of people that would just rather not speak. Right. And then, and, and as soon as they make that decision, 
the First Amendment violations happened. Hmm. Now, Peter, so. to my knowledge, this this insanity doesn't really apply to foods, correct? Like, it's a lot looser. You talk about the various benefits of foods, and I mean, like, it's all kind of just understood yeah. that like you take this information or you leave this information. Nobody completely agrees with food. Every government has a different recommendation for what the perfect food is, you know. But we don't we don't have yeah. these same limitations. You can't sue me over what I'm saying with food. I could say well, everybody should eat fruit all the time. That's yeah. that's well, legal for me to say, right? It could be. Uh, and, and this is this is the issue. I mean, this is how people need to understand how how it works with the FDA. So the example I, I give people is always that you take take a glass of orange juice, right? Um, let's call like a shot glass of orange juice. Depending on what you say about that orange juice, it can be regulated as a food. It could be a dietary supplement. If you're t telling people you're supplementing diet with vitamin C, it could be a cosmetic. If you're telling people to pour it on their hair and, you know, it's going to somehow bleach their hair or something in the sun, I don't know. It could be, um, it could be a drug. If you're telling people that, you know, injecting the orange juice into, you know, a tumor is going to shrink the, the, the tumor. So this all goes back to what we call the intended use doctrine under FDA. Mm. Uh, FDA regulates products based on really what you intend their use to be, not necessarily what they are. So the exact same product, the exact same chemical formulation, the exact what you know, it can be regulated entirely differently based on what you say it does. And so it, again, going back to the commercial component, if you're selling, if you're selling fruit. And you're selling it, um, you know, like a certain type of grape, let's say, and you're and and uh, you're you have an internet business, and and you're providing that. If you're just saying, hey, this is fruit, eat it because it has good nutritional nutritional value, and you know it's a healthy alternative to something else. Go, you know, you're fine. But if you start making health claims about those th those fruits, it's entirely possible the FDA can come to you and say, depending on what you're saying, you might be selling an unapproved drug, like the mm. word treatment. Right. So take, you know, you're saying eat, eat this fruit because it's going, if this, you take this specific fruit and eat it in a certain amount and quantity, it will um, prevent you from um, contracting certain illness. You do that and, and it, it would, it theoretically could be classified as a drug by the FDA. And it's, and that, that is, sounds crazy, but yeah. that's how the FDA operates. I, I think it's significant to note that going back to the Kevin Trudeau thing, his book that got him in trouble has the word cure on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's very significant. We don't, we stay away from that word. We don't use that word. Yeah. And, I mean, and he ran infomercials. So this yeah. is back to what you were saying about when it becomes commercial, now you're in dangerous territory. Yeah. And Ke Kevin's, you know, concerns, um, you know, obviously, especially with, with the FTC and early, uh, early on, I mean, they, they related, a lot to what he was saying about the book and how he was advertising and marketing it and what he was promising consumers, not necessarily about the speech that was contained within the book itself. Um, with, and that's an important distinction in most instances because literature is unquestionably, you know, it's, it's going to be protected. Uh, and, and so it, the, the government had some restrictions on how they could go after him. And, but and that's a fascinating, that, that, that entire circumstances fascinating to, to, to watch it unfold all the way up through seventh circuit otherwise well there's another one another famous case in the 1980s with a man named dr Savy, mm -hmm. who as far as anyone knows never earned a doctorate he just called himself dr Savy. he was running ads saying that he could cure hiv and other things mm -hmm. he ended up in court and he brought his testimonials into the courtroom and they let him go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we've I've you know I've obviously I've been in the courtroom with in criminal prosecutions of practitioners that are that are essentially accused of you know a lot of times it's it's promising things they can't deliver. A lot of times you'll see these actions against practitioners because they're they're misrepresenting the nature of what they provide. So I mean, it, it you know false and, and misleading speech the government would say is certainly not protected. Um, so if they can say that something you're you're doing is false and misleading, then it would lose its constitutional protections. And fraud is also something the government can pursue against people. So it's not hard for them to say, well, if you're promising somebody a cure and that cure doesn't exist, or you can't actually establish that you can you can deliver 
on what you're promised, um, then yeah, I mean, the liability flows from that. Um, I, I get all my clients on video, mm -hmm. all of them. <laughs> the yeah. funny thing is I agree with the cautious language. And I think that uh, it helps uh, the image of professionalism and, and the actuality of professionalism. I think that's the professional way to speak. You know, I think it's a telltale sign of an amateur when they're making broad blanket statements. Like if you just do this, this will work absolutely for everybody. No, anybody who's been working with people a long time knows every case is just a little bit different. There's surprises. Surprises can happen. There's things that can change things. There's nothing that just automatically works for everybody. It just doesn't, right? Sometimes right. even the 90th century nutrients, sometimes it's actually something else that's causing their problem. Sometimes it's a root canal infection or something. There's other things that can matter, right? It's just, you can't, you can never um, truthfully say that this one thing will prevent definitely prevent this in everyone it just, it, health doesn't work like that so speaking more realistically actually teaches people how to expect all this stuff so i, I don't have a problem with the actual language that we're forced to use here you know mm -hmm. i don't mind supporting and promoting and maintaining and repairing as opposed to treating and curing it does make more sense it sucks right. that the average person is seeking treatment and seeking drug-like solutions and uh, seeking a cure when it doesn't make sense you know you don't have mm -hmm. diabetes diabetes is a process it's not something that you possess it's not something inside of you it's something that's happening right. it's a verb right your diabetes in is more appropriate to say as ben fuchs pharmacist ben fuchs mm -hmm. says so uh, where are we at now then with all of this like so there's all these cases the, the whitaker cases the shaw cases the wallet cases we've gotten many qualified health claims over the years obviously the fda still has to justify its existence and still has to uh, accept right. drugs and, and do all this stuff. It still has to reject claims. I guess that's its job <laughs> to reject mm -hmm. the claim and go to court. I don't know. But right. what kind of litigation are, are we seeing in more recent years? Like that Selenium one you mentioned, I think that was back in mm -hmm. 2013, if I'm not wrong. And that's 10 years ago. So what's been going on yeah. since? Yeah, I mean, so we've, we've, we've entered this period where, I mean, for the most part, a lot of the litigation that we've been, we've been confronted with are, I mentioned the state unfair competition angles where you've had the biggest threats to certain types of industry has come from these state level actions, either, whether they're in, in state court or federal court. Um, home, the, the practice of homeopathy is under assault right now. Um, and, and a, a big, um, reason for that is because of the, state level actions that have, that have been raised in recent times and some of them still pending right now. And so we, our practice has been focused an awful lot on trying to, um, trying to focus on reform and, and, um, and defense of those types of actions at the state level court. And from the FDA side, we've been trying as best as we can at opportunities to push back on the, you know, I, I alluded to this before, but it's the, the FDA calls it the evidence-based review system, right? The EBRS. And that's what the FDA uses to evaluate science when, you know, for foods and dietary supplements. It's what they use to screen out all of the truthful and beneficial health information when they're, when they're evaluating things like health claims and structure function claims and, and other types of, of uh, things you might want to say. So we've been, you know, efforts have been made to try and push back against that. You, of course, um, you know, major change often has to come through legislation. And we're aware of that. So, um, you know, there's, there's always efforts, you know, undergoing through that, um, you know, our, our name, our name partner, <laughs> I'll give them a plug here. Our name partner, Jonathan E. Mordock, he's running for Senate in Virginia right now. And uh, you know, very, you know, we're very excited about that. And we, we love what that would mean, what, what, what success would mean for the entire industry because of, um, you know, having someone like Jonathan with his voice in Washington. Um, and, and so we, we put our full support behind that, but, um, it's important for people to understand that every day is a battle, even if there aren't, um, these watershed cases that are, that are you know, proceeding, um, you know, through, um, the upper levels of the federal judiciary, we're still fighting these battles every single day on, you know, at lower levels in the courts and, um, constantly battling the FDA on enforcement proceedings. Um, and trying to be um, that barrier between um, the Constitution and and the agency, and so it, it, it's 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 exhausting at times, but you know we continue to have a lot of success, so we're, we're hopeful. You know we have a a strong court um, right now at the Supreme Court level. In um, what do you mean strong? Like is it in favor of a lot of these pro speech consumer things? 
The court is um, in favor of drawing down and drawing back on certain doctrines that the agencies have historically used um, to run roughshod over industry. And so, you know, recent decisions, you've seen the um, West Virginia EPA case that came down on, and under the major questions doctrine. Um, it was a case interpreting the Clean Air Act, but statements that were made and in, in, in the holding of that case is a strong indication that the courts, the federal courts, are no longer willing to just rubber stamp administrative decisions. And that's always been our problem. So, so you're, you're sitting there like, we got 130 cases, so what do you right. up, up, stamp now? So, and, and that's exactly right. So, what would happen when you go to the federal court and, and you're appealing an administrative decision in years past? They would say, we don't second guess the agency's fact finding. So, you know, if you come to us with an issue of law, that's one thing. But if we don't, we just defer to the agency on on their evaluation of the facts. And any lawyer will tell you, you know, even someone in law school, if I get to write the facts, chances are I should win every time, right? And so if I don't have a court that's willing to actually look at the agency's fact finding, if they're not going to actually question what the agency did with the science, then it makes it very difficult to prevail. But now you have these doctrines that are we, we have we have hope for the future because of the way we think the federal courts are likely to start whittling down on doctrines the chevron doctrine is another one you know which which deals with deference to the agencies and so it's just the beginning now but we're hoping with with judges on the bench now like Gorsuch, for example who have historically been you know against the regulatory state in their scholarly writings and their decisions you know, we, we look to what where the where this precedent could go five, ten years from now. And it and it, it seemed we, we were optimistic. So, Peter, because I'm in the state of Connecticut, it would make sense for me to retain a lawyer in Connecticut, right? Because of the state board. Yeah. Yeah. You would need I mean, and everybody lo local local representation is is really important and especially when you're dealing with with those those issues like unauthorized practice of medicine state state medical board issues it's it's definitely something that you know you you want to have consultation with right um you know when we litigate our firm oftentimes we're able to litigate in different jurisdictions because there are rules that are that allow for you know admission for one matter or so but we don't we don't practice in multiple states other than where we're actually licensed right. for state level issues so yeah it's it's always advisable to reach out and have counsel whenever you have these questions and what kind of counselor it, cause there's so many different types of lawyers so if you have it depends on the question so if you have if you have concerns about let's say uh, you know, somebody you know unauthorized practice in medicine or um, you know, something that would be within the purview of a medical board or any kind of licensing body then there are lawyers that specialize in disciplinary actions before those medical bodies and so and, and actually sometimes they're pretty easy to find because they you know advertise those at that experience and um you know, you, you would find somebody who's experienced in um, assisting someone with, let's say, a disciplinary complaint, whether it be board of optometry, medical board, right, dental board, whatever it is in that particular state, somebody has experience doing that. Um, if it's advertising related, if it's something that, um, you know, concerns, you know, more business um, toward or consumer um, protective issues, then you're going to find a lawyer that specializes in litigation related to those types of claims and we have obviously you know our firm has 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 partners all throughout the country that we work with and we refer people to all the time so uh, you know i'll uh welcome anybody who has any of those concerns they can always call us and we can we can put them in the right direction to someone who can help yeah that would be good because i i think one of the key points of this entire recording to me was that it's at the state level that we really need that protection. The, the alphabet boys aren't, I, I feel like if anything, they're just going to go to their friends at Facebook. They're going to go to their friends at TikTok and behind the scenes, be like, shut this guy off, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you find yourself in trouble, it depends, you, you know, you, you, you react to where it's coming from and, and you seek uh, counsel based on those circumstances. Oftentimes, 
and this is what our practice deals with when when you find if you can find yourself in compliance with the federal law then that very often is insulation against the state level issues as well so it's sort of you know yeah, meeting meeting those those higher standards at the federal level can can help you. And so when we have we have sort of two different components to our practice, we have a compliance practice where you know we we help businesses and, and individuals comply with federal laws and regulations. Mm. And then we have a litigation practice where we help put the fires out when people may get in trouble for that. So that's yeah. a beauty of a whole firm. You you get the whole yeah, yeah. totally makes sense. Yeah. Get licensed in Connecticut, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've been over to Connecticut. Um, I mentioned, I think, when I last spoke, I, at least once, I know, in recent times. But um, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm. I'm originally, my. I'm born and raised in White Plains, New York. So. Ah, okay. Yeah, we have, we have attorneys who are licensed in New York, and we're over there every once in a while. Okay. All right. I have a question about the uh, 2020 stuff. Um, so... Mm -hmm. Government came out, made a bunch of claims. I know that most of the censorship actually happened on social media, which is private companies technically doing what they're allowed to do. You're allowed to censor on your own thing. I'm allowed to censor in, on, on my own. If I, had, if I owned YouTube, I could censor it too. Maybe I don't want pornography on it. All kinds of things I don't want on it. You know, right. we, can, we can always argue about the lines of what is appropriate to censor. And if you don't like a platform censorship, you can use another platform. These platforms are free. Cannot complain that much. But my real question is, legislatively was anything done about free speech around covid because of covid was any anything new introduced about the way that we can speak about treatments or drugs or anything or was this literally just social media just censoring people for talking about alternative ideas on what's going on or alternative possible treatments to it yeah I, so i i think um you know i i wouldn't quote me but i do remember that there were some legislative efforts initiated to try and address these types of issues but really where but none of none of those actually matured in anything that you know would, would be worthwhile where there was some movement was uh, in recent times there were suggestions that the the supreme court might whittle away at the protections that these social media companies had under the communications the decency act that which gave them complete immunity for pretty much anything that they did with their um, user-generated content. I mean, I think most people are familiar with, you know, that Section 230 liability in CDA. It's what companies like, like, you know, the YouTube and Twitters of the world, they always hide behind that when they, when they either choose to host or not host certain content. And when they started serving in the role as edit, ed, you know, editorializing basically and choosing what content to actually display versus what not to display, banning people and whatnot, there was an argument that they they might have been stepping beyond their immunity under the, the Section Two Hundred and Thirty, and there was hope that the Supreme Court might actually um, address that this term and might actually whittle away at those protections and that would then be okay one step as i mentioned you know in, in as we're building this wall one step in the process of trying to have better you know better precedent across the country unfortunately based on what's been reported the oral argument didn't seem to be going very well um, and it doesn't look like the court might actually address those concerns this time through but legislatively that's what you would look to you have to start taking away or addressing you know, the immunities that some of these these companies would be able to assert when they take action to censor people, and for example, or they choose to editorialize content or otherwise. And people on the other side of that would say, well, that, that could have really big ramifications under the First Amendment. We should definitely not do that, right? I mean, we should make sure that these companies have full reign to choose what they display otherwise. Anytime you whittle away at protections, it, it gives people channels to sue based on content, and that could have a chilling effect. Um, but the bottom line is, unless there are, unless there are avenues to actually, you know, go after those private companies for their speech, speech censorship, really is what we're talking about here. Then you you face a problem because as private actors, they can do whatever they want, and you know, there's no breach of contract claim you're going to be able to mount against them because their terms of use and otherwise are so um, friendly to the to the you know, you know, those companies. And it's such a strange situation. If you block half the side of the argument, you, you literally drive the culture and you drive the leading opinions. And 
you know, whether this is true or not, it just see, like whether either side is true or not seems completely irrelevant to me. But I, I understand it's not completely the government's fault. It is social media. I don't know if there's some larger conspiracy there, you know, collusion between uh, media, social media and government. It seems to be at least they all believe the same things and are all agreeing what to do about it, which is censor quite a lot of it. So you're saying they yeah. tr they tried to put forward legislation here to limit speech, but they failed. Well, it's, I mean, the problem you have with, with everything is that there's always, you know, there are unintended consequences to everything you do. And there's, there's arguments on both sides of the coin. Like, for example, you know, the, the FCC used to have um, regulations that would require, you know, people to provide um, viewpoint, uh, you know, equal, equal airtime to people that had um, on both different sides of a particular, you know, controversy or otherwise. And I mean, if you think about it, if you're, if you're somebody that operates any kind of a media outlet or otherwise, um, the, you know, CNN's Fox News is, I mean, it's, it's difficult to try and argue that they should be forced to, to sponsor speech that they don't agree with. And so if, if somebody like, you know, who, who own, you know, obviously you know, now Elon Musk or somebody at Twitter or otherwise, you know, they decide that that certain speech is in, in conflict with what their core goals or values are. Um, do we have a system or should, should the First Amendment require them to endorse speech that they're not comfortable with? Right. And you can obviously see the argument brewing there. So but whatever whatever is going to happen here, it's pretty clear that it probably needs a legislative solution. And whatever that legislative solution looks like, it has to be very carefully designed to be able to balance these competing interests. Um, we just haven't seen that yet. Well, I think we've covered a, a pretty good range here of, of this topic. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm really, really happy you came here. Thank you again, Peter. Um, I just have a comment here. You mentioned homeopathy. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is just another case of like, what harm, you know, why would anybody be against homeo homeopaths, in my opinion? Like, they're so harmless. I also know it can be extraordinarily helpful, if not the thing that fixes some people. You know, Dr. Glidden, for example, he'll look you straight in the face and say that homeopathic remedies have fixed some of my hardest cases. And I've met several other homeopaths who say the same thing. So they recognize that it's not a cure-all for everything, you know, but when it works, it works, is what they say. You can right. believe it or not. And to me, like, the whole thing against homeopaths for, as far as i can tell is basically about false hope you know let's shut down this whole branch of medicine because it may cause people to not do the regular chemotherapy or whatever you know they right. give them give them false hope in this one thing false but hope. Uh, to I, me I I get get, it's subjective I get, though i get hit with that all the time i just wanted to throw that out there yeah this the is time. so subjective i mean is anybody uh, it's suing Matt Damon, you know, for giving them false hope about Bitcoin or, you know, Jim Cramer's allowed to go on TV and, and tell you to buy it into Silicon Valley Bank right before it collapses. I mean, false right. hope is all over the place. This goes back again to the intelligence of the person. It is up to you if you put all your money in Bitcoin and it's not Matt Damon's fault, but false hope, homeopathy, who cares? No one's dying from homeopathy. Never, ever. Yeah. You know, it, it, it parallels the, the sort of, you know, right to try um, efforts that, you know, in laws with when it comes to certain drugs. I mean, I think that the point is that you have just a massive amount of um, you know, people in this, that, that, that want homeopathic remedies. They, they understand what homeopathy is and, they, and, they, and that's the, you know, for whatever reason, that's their preferred course of treatment. Um, and, you know, why would the government stand in the way of people you know, making informed choices with what their with their bodies? You know, I think that you know, this is a deeper conversation, perhaps, but you get into the, the state of you know where we are with medical autonomy, right? Especially when you saw things you know, what, what happened during COVID, mm -hmm. uh, and you know this this echoes that. I mean, somebody's right to 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 be able to choose a a specific you know, medical modality that they think is effective for them. There's, we live in a world where information is available now. You know, yes, there's misinformation, but there's also easy access to, to you know, reliable sources of information out there that people can, can make decisions for themselves. Um, what basis does the government have to come and step in and say we should more or less eradicate this, this, you know, this type of product from the market, which is effectively what the FDA is trying to do at this point? I have one more, one more for you here. Because homeopathy, it's kind of considered the deep end. Well, uh, the pool gets deeper. I talked to a doctor a couple of weeks ago who, in all seriousness, he treats people by writing hieroglyphs 
Egyptian hieroglyphs, straight up. This is his treatment method. And, you know, he's not bashful or shy about it in any way. He has extreme confidence <laughs> in what his hieroglyphs mm -hmm. can do. I'm not laughing because the thing itself is funny. I'm laughing because I know how extreme some of these metaphysical treatments and methods, I know how extreme they can be. The most miraculous things I've ever seen and heard of happen in the metaphysical category of things, mm -hmm. the energy categories of things. This is beyond nutrition. This is beyond medicine. I'm wondering, is there anything legislatively constraining metaphysical practitioners on the same level as someone using a physical compound such as a homeopathic remedy or any any supplement or anything like that are metaphysical practitioners are, are they regulated in the, in the law at all do they have anything to do with the fda because it's not a product right well sure i mean they'll you know even at the at the state level they'll you know that what if what they're doing is diagnosing and treating medical conditions they're they're likely practicing medicine under whatever state medical act would apply in their jurisdiction so you have limitations that that come from that and there are carve outs in all the different states right i mean for for different types of practices within that in california you know nutritionists and otherwise i mean they they needed legislative solutions so that they could do that without being deemed to be you know unauthorized practitioners and so you have that at the federal level they would probably not be regulated per se unless what they're doing is you know involves the sale of certain types of things or the use of some of regulated devices or otherwise and so there's potential hooks for federal regulation but oftentimes where you see that regulation is at the at the local level interesting well i think yeah. I'm, I'm out of questions for now honestly I, I would love to go in and deep dive each individual case step by step point by point i would love to even see the case files and nerd out on it and not just the wallet cases that we've heard so much about but these other cases too the whitaker cases the shaw cases and, and others uh it's it's great stuff it's great information that is used to make these claims like i mean we should all know this <laughs> we should all know yeah. and, and that's the great thing about these qualified health claims actually when they do get granted when we do have them you know being able to say that supplementing with omega-3 essential fatty acid can lower your risk of heart attack and stroke or thrombosis right. various thrombosis the, the fact that you can you can know that is fantastic but i'd also like to dig into the uh, presumed mountains of data that went into securing that claim and i think it's a great thing that we end up with these things it's a bit of a bit of a convoluted process to get there and i don't think we necessarily need the fda but once it brings us to a place where we can agree that selenium lowers your risk of cancer, for example, or folic acid lowers your risk of birth defects in the form of neural tube defects, or that omega-3 protects your heart. I mean, it's great. Now we have this information. Hopefully it stays protected. Peter R. Hangelski, thank you so much. I'm uh, not imagining that too many of our listeners will be needing this specific type of legal uh, representation anytime soon, but just if you could tell us in closing, where exactly uh, can they get in contact or see uh, your firm and do you guys do any other types of cases oh yeah we we um we do a lot of uh, business litigation usually involving these two same types of areas so we do a lot of false advertising defense lanham act cases um which are really you know competitor cases we do a lot of components to that um we defend unfair competition cases in in various states um you know i'm licensed in california and arizona and so we we're often in court there. Um, so yeah, anyone want, yeah, I, I really truly say this and I mean, and I hope nobody needs this type of help, but if they ever do, we have a website, emord.com, www.emord.com. Um, and we have offices in, in the DC area and here in Arizona for the West, West coasters. And yeah, I mean, we're, we're happy to, we're always happy to, to, to talk with anybody, you know, we, the, we give free consultations all the time. So, you know, I'm happy to chat with people about any, anything that might come their way. Fantastic. Oh, we'll be chatting. <laughs> so uh, this is actually my last question. It's a very small question. You said that in book form, all speech is protected. Amazon might ban me, but legally I can call my book doctors cause dementia, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it, you're, you're entitled to your, to express your opinions in literary works. And then it, and especially when you're talking about issues of public importance like that, um, your, your, um, protections are at their zenith. Well, that's fantastic. I've consulted with a lawyer. If you want free law advice, you just start a podcast. That's what I'm told. <laughs> Dr. Reese, you have any closing remarks? 
No, I'm just I'm just happy that we had this this talk. It's very, very informative, very enlightening, very necessary. Yep, necessary is the word. Necessary is really great. Thank you both. Thank everybody else for joining us. We'll see everybody next time. Yeah, thank you guys for having me.